As we've been reporting, it is not just in Egypt. A wave of anti-government protests has spread throughout the Arab world. In Yemen, the president has vowed not to run for re-election after 2013. But today, tens of thousands rallied there, demanding he leave now. Algeria's president tried to ease the tension in his country, promising today to lift the state of emergency that's been in effect since 1992. With so many long-standing regimes suddenly threatened, the sands are shifting in the Middle East. Tonight, national security correspondent David Martin puts it all in focus. In Egypt, the Nile moves slowly and the people are accustomed for 3,000 years to centralized authority. If the pharaoh is toppled, then that will have not a ripple effect, but a tsunami effect across the Arab world. The pharaoh, of course, is Egypt's Mubarak, leader of one of the world's oldest civilizations and in many ways the anchor of the Middle East. Egypt is the largest, uh, most powerful Arab country. Nothing ever seemed to change there. Well, change has now come to the Middle East. It will never be the same again. For the first time in Egyptian history, from Pharaoh still now, Egypt had a genuine revolution. The Middle East already has the highest jobless rate in the world, over 10 percent. And it's four times higher among young workers. Governments need to create 100 million new jobs in this decade to avert mass unemployment. You have push carts, people on donkeys riding alongside Mercedes-Benz and BMWs. It's that visible gap that really produces anger, a sense that their regimes are not responsive to their needs. I think no Arab country is immune. Uh, certainly each Arab country is different. Is the day of the repressive, corrupt Arab regime over? Business as usual is not sustainable. The empowerment of the public on the scale that we have seen changes the calculations of every single ruler, including the Egyptian government itself, even if it stays in power. Yemen, Algeria, Sudan, Libya, all of these countries are potential flashpoints. Of all the countries that have to look with caution at what's happened in these countries, then uh, Syria has to be very high on that list. Syria has been ruled by the Assad dynasty, first the father and now the son, for 40 years. Yemen's president has ruled for 32 years. But faced with his own demonstrations, he apparently has given up his dynastic ambitions and announced he will not run for re-election and his son will not succeed him. If things fall apart in Yemen, al-Qaeda will be in a position to take advantage of that. Only the oil-rich monarchies of the Persian Gulf seem safe from the tsunami of popular discontent. The Gulf leaders have money from their oil revenues to buy off dissent. In the short term, the unrest in the Middle East will send oil prices up because what we're going to have is great uncertainty about where things are going. For decades, American foreign policy has relied on authoritarian Arab regimes to achieve its overriding goal of Middle East stability. We want to see the free flow of oil at reasonable prices uh, coming out of the Middle East. And we want to uh, avoid wars erupting there between our allies in the Arab world and our ally in Israel. Now those regimes, even if they are not overthrown, will be less willing to do America's bidding. In the short term, every government is undoubtedly going to be more responsive to public opinion, and public opinion is angry with America. How that dust settles will partly determine whether this is an inspiration to people or a cautionary tale about what happens when you get rid of a government that you might not like, but which might be replaced by something much worse. Giving power to the people of the Middle East could validate American values, but undercut American interests. David Martin, CBS News, Washington.